You're listening to the Leaping Choya podcast recorded in the Wrong Mountain Yurt in the Sonoran Desert. I am falling away from this world. I am falling away from this world. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Leaping Choya podcast, here we are another lovely night and um yeah i guess we decided we don't have any small talk i thought you said you had something i mean it's not small talk it's kind of something i was thinking i would say oh, okay should i do it it's actually kind of heavy talk big, <laughs> big, it's actually big talk <laughs> do you want to do it right away or should you yeah bring i'll do it, it right later? away okay. I mean, and we should let's give one one uh caveat emptor uh the baby tonight is on you not me Yes. Because she can nurse on you and that keeps her quiet. Is that the reason? Usually. That's the reason. I mean, usually. And um, so that's going to mean you're going to be reading from your phone, not from a book. Yes. Is that going to change your whole performance? Probably. Okay. So we're going to have a different type of performance tonight, a more digital, <laughs> digital performance. Um, what was I going to say? It's kind of weird. I don't know if I feel kind of weird saying it, but, um, I had this thought in the car this week I, and I swore I would open our episode with it. And it was, uh, maybe I was talking to you. Uh, I don't know. The, the phrase that came to me was, uh, we read Heidegger as a Nazi fool. Hmm. Um, meaning, uh, you know, there's always been this skeleton in the closet or, or pink elephant in the sauna or whatever the phrase is. Uh, you know, you know, our good friends, you know, oh, isn't he that Nazi, et cetera, you know. And um, I think what dawned on me is that uh, I think it's important to understand that, that um, and for me this, I mean, I'm going to say it right up front, this, this cuts to the heart of liberalism. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't read anything as scripture. I don't read anything as the sacred word of a moral man or woman. Mm -hmm. I don't read anything as fully believable. I don't read anything as righteous or my position or uh, in the bubble or I don't read anything as hooray, I'm so glad someone has my view too Hmm. I'm not alone Uh, I don't read anything as that I don't read anything as the example of someone's ethical structure Um, I don't need that kind of relationship I don't have a religion I don't I don't need preachers prophets uh, you know um, and I think it hit me this week that uh, you know I'm also not necessarily reading Heidegger as like the gospel truth. And I think there's a tendency in liberalism to demand that your writers represent something, that they represent a good or a, or a, a, a communal standard, or they're torchbearers of your ideology, or they're exemplars of your people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do not need that. I don't have that. And I'm not looking for that. Mm-hmm. Um, if Heidegger is just a Nazi fool, and I, that's, you know, to me, that's a, that's a two word phrase. You know, he's a Nazi. He joined the Nazi party at some point. Um, and everybody's had all this, you know, talk and talk and talk and talk about that. And, you know, he's a fool. If his ideas are just those of a fool, well, so be it. Mm. I think that, if you can strip away the ethical need and the sort of, uh, you know, oh, you're all alone in a morally corrupt universe and you need someone to come hold your damn hand mm. stuff, then really, why do we read Heidegger? We read Heidegger because his ideas are utterly startling. Uh, they are challenging, weird dark, wonderful, inspiring, 
But that's only as we interpret them. Mm. Uh, they are springboards to wild interpretations, and we don't say that our interpretations are right. They're just how we are springboarding off him. Mm. And if he's just a Nazi fool, then we're reading about and by, we're reading words by a Nazi fool. That's what it is. Oh, well. His, I guess his... But how can he be strange and wonderful if he's a fool? I'd say he couldn't be strange and wonderful if he wasn't a fool. And again, by fool, I just mean um, someone to whom I don't ascribe epistemic authority mm. mm -hmm. simply because I need that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, You know, again, I think there's, I mean, uh, you know, I could just say he's a Nazi poet. You want me to say that instead? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, Nazi fool is more dramatic. I guess it is. You know, I just say Nazi fool because those are two very strong words. Yeah. Right? But it's kind of, it, it, the, the, the duo says to me, A, if he's a fool, I'm not reading him as... A, a scriptural wise man whose every thought is astounding. I think it is, actually. Mm. Uh, but I don't know. What's the difference between a, a wise person and a fool? Mm. Maybe we'll figure that out. I mean, mm. I think in a certain sense, a fool is someone that liberalism uh, turns away because the form of their knowledge is not appropriate. And I don't mean appropriate morally or politically. I mean it's not the right, it's not the right kind of knowledge. It's not the knowledge that is considered to be needed now. Mm. And I and I guess it's also to me just like wiping away the whole like oh how many fucking books do we need to read about Heidegger being a Nazi? How many times do we have to hear liberal liberals talking about how he was a Nazi and blah blah blah? Mm. I just think it's all bullshit. And and by the way, if someone's a Nazi, uh, you know. Um, that doesn't mean you don't read them. I'm not saying you read them because they're a Nazi, but someone's thing, what they were doing, whatever politically, uh, or at a certain history point in history, you know, if if Heidegger, you know, and again, whatever it means for Heidegger to be a Nazi, we don't even know what that means. Hmm. Um, if Heidegger was a serial killer, we would read him. Maybe. <laughs> that would be kind of creepy. <laughs> that would be creepy. <laughs> but to some people, that's what saying he's Nazi is, but that's yeah. not exactly what was going on. That's not exactly the type of Nazi he is, shall, yeah. we, shall we say. Yeah. Um, well, it's like a vote for experiencing and engaging in art independent of politics. I think that's pretty In much what it is. Yeah. If you Yeah, I think it's even it's even like uh, I mean, you're talking about something bigger, I think. I mean, look, there uh, yes, I am in a sense and also there's a way to you can read Heidegger as a Nazi fool mm -hmm. and you can read Heidegger as a non-Nazi genius. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. You can so in other words, all the books written about Heidegger's membership of the Nazi party in 1933, um, you know, are assuming that if you're reading Heidegger, you're reading him as a Nazi. Mm. But you only read something as you decide to read it. Um, his Naziness is not everything about him. And it doesn't even have to be the essential thing if you're going to do a non-Nazi reading. Mm. I guess what I'm say I was saying is I'm fine with the idea that I'm reading Heidegger as a Nazi fool. Mm. Saying he's a Nazi fool is not for me. It, you know, oh well, then I won't read him. Mm -hmm. You know, because when I go and read him, I'm witnessing incredible thoughts. Mm -hmm. His character, his ethical decisions, his place in history. However, that none of that's objective to me, and I don't really care. Mm. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That makes sense. All right. So that was what I wanted to say. Yeah. Cool. Uh, you just thought that while we were driving? 
Yeah, I thought you were in the car with me. You didn't say it out loud. You did not say it. Oh, really? No. Pull your mic a little closer to your mouth. Oh. A little closer. A little down. A little down. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, that's good. That's too much. That's too much, yeah. That's probably good. Okay. You ready to go? Yep. You got your text? Yeah, let me pull it up. So, like I said, uh, reading off the phone, uh, we are on section 20. Is that what we're calling these, or chapters? I don't know. Section 20. Section, yeah. Of Contributions to Philosophy of the Event by Martin the Nazi Fool Heidegger. Um, this section is called The Beginning and Inceptual Thinking, right? Are you there? Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, we're good to go. I'd love to, I can't wait to hear what he has to say. The beginning is what grounds itself and what reaches ahead. It is self grounding in the ground which is fathomed and opened up through the beginning. The beginning reaches ahead insofar as it grounds and is therefore unsurpassable. Because every beginning is unsurpassable, it must constantly be repeated and must be placed through confrontation into the uniqueness of its incipience and thus of its ineluctable reaching ahead. This confrontation is original when it itself is inceptual, but this necessarily as another beginning. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I've seen this passage before. I kind of, weirdly enough, we were talking the other night about how, having read through half the book already together, we, 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 we still, most of it, we don't remember reading. I remember this a little bit. Hmm. And it's kind of lovely the idea that the beginning, the beginning of anything, whatever we ascribe with beginning nature, uh, is grounded, grounds itself in the ground, um, becomes a fact. That is the beginning, and uh, that beginning reaches ahead because it insinuates a uh, coming to be out of the beginning. Um, it's unsurpassable. There's nothing before it. It is the beginning. Uh, and it's constantly repeated, uh, meaning it's constantly replaced as the beginning of everything because everything done in relation to that beginning references back to that beginning. And it's placed through confrontation into the uniqueness of its incipience. So it's, it's placed through confrontation, through confronting it or what it confronts or by being a confronting thing. Uh, in, it's, it's placed into the uniqueness of its incipience, of its beginning, and thus of its irresistible reaching ahead. Uh, this confrontation is the original when it itself is inceptual. Sorry, we're having a little a spit up. Oh, we have can some we have spit up? Can we have a moment, a pause? Sure, sure. Okay, yeah, we had a little baby spit up. I think we've cleaned it up. Yep. All right. Baby is stirring and googling, <laughs> which is fine. Oh, yeah, th- th- this last sentence, this confrontation is original when it itself is inceptual, but this necessarily is another beginning. So even within the beginning, when a beginning confronts what follows it, um, that confrontation becomes another beginning. Uh, so the beginning is constantly repeating itself, yet becoming unique uh, as things progress. Okay, so why don't you uh, continue to read. Solely what occurs only once stands in the possibility of repetition. It alone has in itself the ground of the necessity of a reversion to it and a resumption of its incipience. Here repetition does not mean the stupid superficiality and impossibility of the mere occurrence of the same for a second and third time. Indeed, the beginning 
can never be apprehended as the same since it reaches ahead and thus encroaches differently each time on that which it itself initiates. Accordingly, it determines its own repetition. Keep going. Uh, so only what occurs only once stands in the possibility. Only what occurs only once can uh, stands in the possibility of repetition. Can only, it's the only thing that could be repeated. Only it has in itself the ground of the necessity of a reversion to it and a resumption of its incipience. Um, I mean, it seems to me strange that anything could be considered to happen more than only once, but um, I guess we'll we'll grant we'll grant Martin the the. the Maybe the oversight there. Uh, it alone, yeah. Repetition does not mean the stupid superficiality and impossibility of the mere occurrence of the same. See, I mean, he writes, says, says right there, the occurrence of the same is impossible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, for a second and third time. Indeed, the beginning can never be apprehended as the same uh, since it reaches ahead and thus encroaches differently each time on that which it itself initiates. Each time it, it encroaches on what it begins, it is different. Uh, we, we all have experiences with that. Uh, the, be- the beginning of everything changes hue and tone and meaning and mm-hmm. and nature over time. Accordingly, it determines its own repetition. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I have something to say about that, but maybe we should finish the section. No, please. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Um, I was just gonna say that like intrusive thoughts feel very repetitious. So, and, I, and the way he says stupid superficial and an, um well i guess he's saying and the impossibility of it too but there's still i don't know there's something and in the literature there's this idea that like if you know stuff is repeated it means it's not in a way original or it's not real i guess see that's just, that's an interesting that's a fascinating comment, actually. I mean, uh, as I said, uh, and as Heidegger says before, the repetition is impossible. Mm-hmm. The occurrence of the same is impossible. Yeah. Uh, identity is always false over time. Mm-hmm. And that the anxiety literature would be saying something as, as stupid as uh, these thoughts are repetitions or they're repeating uh, is, is telling. I mean... You know, if you have what you think is the same thought over and over again, Mm -hmm. uh, what you have to ask yourself is, well, what is the content of the thought? Because that's what you're claiming is the same. Now, if it's let's say it's a sentence, right? I am an I am an awful person. 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 Mm -hmm. The content of that sentence is, I am an awful person. Those are the word cuts. The word content. But the contextual content, the time-space content, the bang of that phrase, uh, the reason that 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 phrase is never a repetition is that phrase emerges from different time-space contexts. Mm -hmm. And only a shallow mind and and a mind in the grips of identitarian diagnostics would, would, would... would claim that 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 sentence is repetition, or that you're in the presence of repetition. Indeed, I think that thinking you're in the presence of repetition, or or having an experience of being in the presence of repetition, or an identity, in other words, um, is the problem. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's uh, kind of segregating away the content out of its context. Mm-hmm. And thinking the content has something to tell you, or the content means something, but it never does. Mm-hmm. Only the full context of what you are is what you are. Mm-hmm. And to focus on the repetition of that phrase and, and start to go mad because this th- same phrase, nothing is ever the same, nothing repeats, nothing is identical to itself over time. Mm-hmm. And to think so is stupid. And to, to, um, to live in... A world in which there is repetition is not to live in the world. It's to live in a world view. 
Uh, so I think part of maybe part of the arc of anxiety healing and curing is doing the deep bang work of uh, de-identifying each time that thought occurs, de-repetitioning it, hmm. coming to an experiential bedrock or an experiential foundation with yourself where the event of that statement is always a unique event mm -hmm. and that you're experiencing it as that and the information you're receiving from it and that's the most important thing is uh, variegated unique temporal mm -hmm. uh, and you lose the idea of being haunted by repetition which can't exist the idea that repetition is existing in you is a is a delusion mm. it's it's in a way it's a psychosis all right yeah what, what uh mm. what, you want to go on but i uh, thank you for that yeah. that's cool i like that did you have, do you have anything to respond no, to no i think that's a really that's a very interesting point i've never never thought of it that way before i think because the words are the same like you start sort of started with the sentence is the same i've thought of it as a repetition but yeah see liberalism liberalism wants <laughs> liberalism yeah. wants you to be having the same experience again and again and again mm -hmm. it wants you to be operating like a binary machine language. Mm -hmm. Only ones and zeros. Ones repeat, the <laughs> zeros repeat, the ones repeat, the zeros repeat. And it's all denuded of any humanity, any experience, any bang. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's called machination. Yeah. That's exactly what machination yeah. is. Yeah. Is the propagation of repetition against the entropy of reality. And as much as you get stuck in that grinding mundanity of banal being abandoned by being, that, you know, that itself is anxiety. Yeah. Anxiety inducing. Yeah. That's very true. Because it's not natural. It's not real. You're stuck in an artificial loop Mm -hmm. maybe Heidi yeah. has something more to say about yeah. that yeah. whenever you're ready what is inceptual is never the new because the new is merely what is already fast becoming passe nor is the beginning ever the quote eternal because the beginning is precisely not taken out of and away from history. Yet what is the beginning of thinking if thinking signifies meditation on beings as such and on the truth of bang? Mm. What is inceptual is never the new, because the new is merely what is already fast becoming past So <laughs> the inceptual... In, you know, inceptual thinking, as Heidegger uses it, is he's just trying to extract that from newness or mm -hmm. novelness. And the beginning is never eternal. Hmm. Uh, which is, and then the, the because the 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 the, 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 the because clause here, the beginning because the beginning is precisely not taken out of. And away from history. Uh, I don't know what that means. Why? Okay. Nor is the beginning ever eternal. Hmm. Because it's not taken out of and away from. History. Oh. That's like sameness over time. Yeah. The beginning exists in history. It's yeah. not eternal. It's it, it emerges from history. It's historically... Yeah specific mm -hmm. then he says okay and he, now he's going to introduce his next section with this question mm. what is the beginning of thinking 
if thinking signifies meditation on beings as such and on the truth of bang. So what is the beginning of thinking? And then we go straight to section 21, which is called inceptual thinking. Mm -hmm. So in a way, beginning thinking. Hmm. Yeah? Yeah. Do you want to keep reading? I mean, I think so. I don't have anything more to say. Do you have anything more to say? No. Yeah. Inception 21. Inceptual thinking. And in parentheses, it says projection. The inventive thinking of the truth of bang is essentially projection. By its very essence, such a projection in being carried out and unfolded must place itself back into that which it opens. This might make it seem that where the projection reigns, there is arbitrariness and a wandering about in what is ungrounded. Yet the projection places itself precisely on the ground and in that way first transforms itself into the necessity to which it is related from the ground up, although in a still hidden way prior to its enactment. Yeah. Again, uh, Heidegger really mapping out thought in a way I've never Mm -hmm. encountered. The inventive thinking of the truth of bang is essentially projection. Well, I, don't, I don't have my German book with me. I don't remember the German word for projection. Do you remember the word he used? I don't. Um, I mean, I think... We... Uh, I mean, I think, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't really remember the specifics of that word. I'm not sure we've gone into it. Yeah. Well, let's see what he says about that word. The inventive thinking of the truth. So, thinking of the truth in a way that invents something, not just droning on and on about a repeated verity. The inventive thinking of the truth of Bang is essentially projection. By its very essence, such a projection in being carried out and unfolded must place itself back into that which it opens. So this projection places itself into what it opens up. So thought that inventively relates to bang, projects itself into what it opens up. This might make it seem that where the projection reigns, there is arbitrariness and a wandering about in what is ungrounded. So where that projection reigns in that which it opens up, it might seem that this would mean that it's ungrounded and arbitrary. But the projection places itself precisely on the ground and in that way first transforms itself into the necessity to which it is related from the ground up, although in a still hidden way prior to its enactment. What is he talking about? Thought on the truth of bang is essentially projection. Now, projection, I think, you know, I think there's really only two possible meanings there. One is sort of like a film projector. Mm -hmm. So it projects an image onto something, an image that is in it. So thought has an image, and it projects that image onto things. The other... uh, way to think about projection is probably 
projecting forward in time. Mm. So thought on the truth of Bang becomes or is naturally an act of casting forward in time uh, or into something, moving forward into something. Um, And I mean, I think, you know, if we're talking about thinking on the truth of bang, so let's take, for instance, uh, if we have the the phrase, I am an awful person, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And we want to, we're committed to understanding the way in which every time we hear that phrase, it is not a repetition, but in fact, every thought is unique. There is no sameness over time. And so we're going to try to think on the truth of the bang, the truth of the bang of that phrase, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And we're going to ask ourselves, well, we're going to, what we're going to say is, okay, when that phrase occurs to me that is an event that is a bang and that event has particular time and place particular context particular setting staging and that is its bang it's you know it's it's abstract word content is is it's being abandoned by being but it's bang is its context and so we're going to think on the truth of that bang right inventively though and so we're going to project right Mm -hmm. into that context in a sense what we're trying to think Mm. aren't we Mm -hmm. because we're not just going to sit there and go uh right Mm -hmm. context no we are on the hunt for context Hmm. aren't we or we're on the hunt for bang we're on the hunt for the truth of bang and so we're projecting a in a sense a thought need Hmm. or a thought agenda or a thought urge for bang openness right that's why he says Mm -hmm. Such a projection places itself back into that which it opens. So as you discover the bang context of that moment when you said to yourself, I'm an awful person, that projection is is going to place itself into that which it opens. It's going to continually open the bang of that context, of that, Mm -hmm. of that, that, that context under that phrase and place, place itself into that. But this doesn't, and what he says is, but this doesn't mean that that you're just like randomly or arbitrarily uh, fumbling your thought way through different uh, bang context variables, Mm -hmm. okay? You're not just randomly running around in there. Uh because the projection places itself, it says he says here, precisely on the ground. So it, the projection, I think what he's saying here is as thought heads to the truth of bang and projects its thought need into that space, it's placing itself on the ground of that space. Hmm. And in that way, it transforms itself into the necessity to which it is related. So it it becomes the necessary reality of that of that thought space of that context hmm. in a way that is yet still hidden. Okay, prior to it actually happening. <laughs> so. You know, this is all very like, I don't know, this reminds me of like yoga teachers talking about mm-hmm. how to get into position, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Move your fibula closer to your tibula. 
Try to arch your left foot a little wider to the right. Uh, you know, don't strain your neck. You know, he's just really going through kind of like, you know, look, this is what happens. Mm. This is your positioning as your thought projects itself into the bang truth space mm. in an attempt to find an inventive uh, relationship, thought relation to what you're looking to discover. And as you do it, you're going to, that projection is not just a blah, blah, blah. It becomes the necessary ground of the space you're investigating. So trust it. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. Trust it. So as you look for the context of I am an awful person and your thought projects into that bang, don't say, oh, I'm just cavorting about in subjective muck mm. no you're actually grounding the necessity of that to which you have a relationship as you seek an inventive uh, thought path into the truth of bang and you're actually fundamentalizing some truths within that event space so it's a very subjective, loopy view of thought mm -hmm. and its object. But it's also, in a sense, objective, objectivizing because he's saying thought becomes the necessary ground. Mm. All right. Yeah, I mean, it seems like if you were to treat thought like that or context like that, you definitely would never repeat it. <laughs> If you were to act, or to actually thoughtfully think about that, mm. yeah. But you, there's a tone in your voice as if, as if, but that is actually logistically and realistically impossible. What do you think I of don't that? Know. I what don't do, think well, what it's do you think impossible. of it? What do you think of this whole idea as a? As a someone, you know, someone standing outside your anxiety and suggesting this to you, are you like, yeah, that sounds like, you know, okay, that's a lot of mumbly muck, or that's not really feasible in the context of anxiety, or that doesn't really alleviate my sense of these being hounding, rep repetitive, nagging thoughts, or what? What's your? I'd like to hear your reaction. Um, I think that there's put. I think there's potential there. I I don't. I think it's does an this, interesting approach. Does this does this does this some of this type of talks sound like anything else people talk about in the anxiety healing mm, world? I Maybe, mean, what are they, what are they? Anything similar to this out there? Um, I mean, not this, uh, layered, sure. but I would say that it, it does make me think of like one thing I've heard said is that the intrusive thought is, um, kind of, uh, a placeholder or, or taking the place of you feeling the real feelings or, mm kind of interrupting or jumping in and I've been you know thinking of it as a being abandoned by being mm. um, to sort of yeah c cover up the true event would be the mm. Heidegger's thing so then so I do feel like there is sort of a parallel there in terms of definitely in terms of trying to figure out what is actually happening. So, do the anxiety doctors advise you? You look into that feeling, that this repetitive, so-called repetitive thought is kind of covering up. I mean, everyone's different. This yeah. one woman, Cheryl Paul, is her name. She she does she does recommend looking into the feeling. I mean, some people. I think I think the more pure OCD people are. Are actually really not into you thinking about the content at all, mm. which I know here we're saying there's a difference between the content and the context. But um, but then some people think that yeah, try, trying to figure out 
the, the deeper psychological reason it's coming up can be helpful. Mm. Which I'm kind of mapping onto what you're saying here. I don't know if it's a true, you know, I don't, I don't know if it's a true. Yeah. It's interesting. I, mean, I, I wouldn't, not. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, and, I, and I'm not saying you did this, but I think it's important to point out that I think, I don't think Heidegger is trying to get us to tend to something called the real psychological reason. Oh, I agree. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, he, I think he's... He would never say that. No. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I mean, I think uh, context is an interesting word. I, I, I don't know what... Maybe maybe context is synonymous with the truth of bang. I'm not sure, but it's it's an interesting question what context really means. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, want to keep reading? I, yeah, I f- sure. I feel like we might be able to finish this section. Sure. But go ahead. The projection of the essence of bang is merely an answer to the call. If unfolded, the projection loses every semblance of self aggrandizement and yet never becomes self loss and surrender what is open by it has persistence only in the grounding that shapes history what is projected in the projection overpowers the projection itself and justifies it yeah the projection of the essence of bang is merely an answer to the call so you're called to investigate the truth of bang that underlies the so-called repetitive thought. So the projection of the essence of bang is just answering that call. And as it unfolds, uh, the projection loses any appearance of being just self-importance, yet it never becomes self-loss or surrender. So it's not, it's not a, it's not a, a, an insipid grandeur and it's not a, uh, a a docile self-flagellation. What is opened by it has persistence only in the grounding that shapes history. So what's opened up by the projection persists uh, in the grounding that it sets up that, that determines history. What is projected in the projection overpowers the projection itself and justifies it. So what you are projecting in your projection I, uh, overpowers that projection, so that, in a sense, the uh, the content of the projection overpowers the the uh, action of the projection and 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 justifies it, renders it, uh, 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 va- uh, gives it value. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. The projection unfolds the projector and at the same time captures the projector in that which is opened up. This capture that pertains to the essential projection is the beginning of the grounding of the truth attained in the projection. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting if you change those words to sort of like the... uh (laughs) The thinking of the anxious person... Hmm unfolds the anxious person and at the same time captures the anxious person in that which the thinking of the anxious person mm-hmm. opens up <laughs> right yeah this capture of the anxious person that pertains to the essential thinking of the anxious person is the beginning of the grounding of the truth attained in the thinking of the anxious person mm. So the anxious person is captured by their thinking. Mm -hmm. Definitely true. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. What and who, quote, is the projector? Yeah. That becomes graspable only out of the truth of the projection. Yet it also becomes concealed at the same time. Yeah. So you know, I, I, I for projector, I, in, I inserted anxious person, mm-hmm. and Heidegger immediately says, "Yes, but what or who is the projector?" Mm-hmm. We, we, you know, we think of it. Oh, it's you. It's the person. It's the self. It's the, yes, but what? 
but we can only know what or who the projector is out of the truth of the projection. Mm. But that also conceals it. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. For this is what is most essential, namely that the opening qua clearing brings into play the self-concealing whereby the sheltering of truth first receives its ground and impetus. Yeah. This is really, I think he says, this is what is most essential. And I think he, he's, he's pointing out that I, I've said this a lot and I mean it really much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the opening that we experience as we seek truth brings into play a self-concealing. So, and that's a, it's, it's such a simple idea, but it's really hard to get, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The opening that occurs through this projection, I mean, let's follow the metaphor of the anxious content, anxious context, Projecting, projecting into the bang of the anxious context uh, brings about an opening and things are opened up and we see, oh, yes, that, oh, yes, that, oh, right. So you're having like, you know, thought perceptions of openness. Uh, but all that stuff that you're seeing open up is sort of like, in, I guess in a, in a contemporary context, we would say, I'm opening my mind to it. Right? Mm -hmm. That opening brings into play the self concealing. Mm -hmm. So, yes, as truth opens up to you, your self is concealed from you. That seems to make sense to me. And I think that's maybe the most mechanical way to think about it is that when something is opened up to you, it hides yourself from you. Mm. It almost gets in between yourself and yourself Mm. because it becomes a truth. Mm. And he finishes by saying, whereby the sheltering of truth first receives its ground and impetus. So in this self-concealing that occurs, the self is concealed from itself via the openness of truth, Truth becomes sheltered in that concealing. So truth kind of you kind of you kind of uh, you kind of domesticate truth, and it becomes this little thing you keep. And in that keeping, you are hidden from yourself. So as you investigate the truth of the bang of the anxious c- context realizing that you are also hiding yourself from yourself. And um, this goes back to the Nazi fool. I mean, everyone's a Nazi fool. And, you know, you don't, you don't want to, um, as you seek to open, as you seek to f- experience the openness of truth, you're concealing yourself from yourself. So there is, I I think uh, I would put it this way, there is no savior. Mm. There is no end. There's, in the realm of thought and discovery and truth, there is no good or bad. Uh... There's opening and concealing and opening and concealing and sheltering. Um, And trying to render a moral uh, fabric to thought, a.k.a. liberalism, simply aborts that cycle of open, conceal, open, conceal, um, and shuts you off from a projection into the truth of bang, and you you just become repetitive. Hmm. Um, 
Yeah. I don't know. Any thoughts? I mean, if... I mean, if your opening is concealing, then how do you move forward? By opening, concealing, opening, concealing. I mean, that's almost Mm -hmm. like, you know, I don't know, they say of the theater, a theater is opening and closing. Mm. Right? Yeah. And how does theater move forward? Well, it opens and then it closes, and then it opens again and it closes, and then it opens and closes. Mm. That's what theater does. So I have to say, I think your sense of moving forward is based on repetition addiction. Mm-hmm. Or finding truths that I can hold on to also. Which would mean repeating them. Yeah, right. When you say hold on to, what you mean is take as a mantra Yeah. that you can repeat and hold on to like a handlebar that never goes away Mm -hmm. that repeats itself time and time again that is there for you always Mm -hmm. trying to have thoughts be there for you always is definitely a recipe for anxiety Mm -hmm. because thoughts are not going to be there for you always because as much as you can try to say that the content that occurs day in and day out is always the same, and oh God, thank God it's there for me. Mm. Thank God that affirmation is there for me. That's a big word now, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, it's not there for you. Yeah. Because its bang is always different, and your ignorance and avoidance of its bang mm-hmm. is your anxiety. Mm-hmm. That's why identity is anxiety. Mm-hmm. Because re- ad- repetition is identity. Identity is non-bang, and non-bang is anxiety. That's the little syllogism, I would say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And needing to hold on to things, and needing to find truths, and calling repetition momentum. Mm -hmm. See, repetition is not momentum. If you're repeating yourself, you're actually not moving. Right. You're just holding on to something. And if you're holding on to something, if you're holding on to something, you know, it might be moving. Mm-hmm. But if it's just repeating itself, where is it taking you? Also, I question whether you can hold on to one thing. Yeah. If you're holding on to everything, you're not moving. Yeah. I I would agree with that. I've tried to find mantras of like, what can I say to my intrusive thoughts when they come that that will like, you know, mm. disempower them. Mm. And I have not found anything. Mm. And so maybe part of it is that that trying to find that is just. Mm. Yeah, and it's I think you know it's definitely not fair to you or anyone to. Uh, um, diminish or uh, belittle the idea of repetitious thoughts because I have no doubt that every single one has a unique terror. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm not just trying to say that's empty and null and you're stupid for seeing that terror because it, it is a phenomenal real experience for you. Um, It strikes me that maybe there's an ambivalent relationship with repetition, that in a sense the repetition is comforting yeah, and terrible. Yeah. Yeah. And that's part of its grip on you, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe? Yeah, seems likely. <laughs> it seems likely. Well, and then in also the... But it seems like, you know, I am an awful person. The phrase repeated constantly. Yeah, I mean, what's, what's, so someone standing outside the whole experience, it's like, and again, all this is easy to say, but it's like so much context comes with that phrase. 
So in a sense, the, the, the work is to, is to investigate why that phrase drags contexts with it. Mm-hmm. Why it carries things along with it. Why it has meaning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, other than, you know, again, other than, uh, for instance, the babblings of a Nazi fool. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Nazi, it's the Nazi fool in your mind that is saying, mm-hmm. I am an awful person. And they're projecting that onto you. And so mm-hmm. partly it goes back to what I was saying in the very beginning, is I think at the essence of liberalism, which again is our entire cultural upbringing, personal upbringing, familial upbringing, intellectual upbringing, at the, at the at the core of of liberalism is this idea that that voice I am an awful person um, has value and is n- and, and if it's mm-hmm. if it's being stated by a Nazi fool in a way that Nazi fool needs to be taken seriously mm-hmm. or that there's I don't know I mean what I'm trying to say about the Nazi fool metaphor is that no statement carries with it its speaker. Hmm. Its speaker is always ascribed to it by the listener. And the the spoken and the speaker can be separated. Hmm. And their alignment and their unity and their identity is taken as law, liberal law. Hmm. But that's just how your brain's been trained. Hmm. The emptiness of I am an awful person, like they, that, that, that statement is so empty, it's not even there. But we need it to be there. And we need it to have a context. And we need someone to be saying it. Hmm. We need them to be talking to someone. We're so trained to contextualize, sentimentalize, departmentalize, compartmentalize, and like, we're so trained in giving meaning to things. Mm-hmm. Like, stop. Yeah. Try to stop. Try to stop giving meaning to things. Give it a go. You know what I mean? I'm not saying, I'm not pointing that phrase at you. I'm saying to anybody myself, anybody, if you want to try to meditate, try this out for a day. Don't get meaning. Hmm. And you'll see how automated you are. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to talk about this whole podcast is how automated are you? Mm -hmm. And what automated you and how can you back propagate and de-learn that automation so that you aren't frenetically, fanatically, fascistically contextualized over and over again against your better feeling? Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, that's well said. Break the automation. Yeah. Hmm. You know, when people say, oh, he's the Nazi, they're automated. They're fucking automated. (laughs) They're just automated. You can smell it when they say it. They're automated. Totally. I mean, there's so many things like that. Yeah. I mean, it's it's all day long I listen to people say automated things. Yeah. All day long, you know? And it's like, so... I'm almost just reading a Nazi fuel fool because I, I don't want to be automated anymore. Hmm. I don't think Heidegger's a Nazi fool, but I, you know, I'm being, I'm being, I'm being, uh, I don't know what the word is, punky <laughs> in putting it that way. But you know, yeah. In, in a way, the automation has driven me so in the liberal automation has driven me so insane that I'm happy to say. Oh, yeah? Well, I, I'm actually reading him 
because he's a Nazi fool. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's yeah. it's like I feel like saying that just because it's like it's such an unautomated thing to do. <laughs> yeah. You know? Like yeah. I must be insane. Yeah. You're reading what and who? What? <laughs> um but I don't think Heidegger means anything and I don't need him to mean anything and I don't have I don't go to him with any context I don't go to him with any with any preconceived I don't care what he was historically I don't know what he was historically I don't even I don't even know why I would even wonder about it when I read his work I think what on earth and most things I don't think what on earth yeah I just think oh great that again yeah more automation automatic writing yeah hmm? yeah totally i mean it's really hard to find a book that has new ideas yeah we found one though we did <laughs> i guess that's it yeah yeah great thank you wonderful night thank you um good night thanks for joining us for the leaping choya podcast for more information, visit leapingchoya.com and be sure and follow us on socials. Until next time.